Hi, my name is Al Richards and I'm here today at Gallery 222 in Malvern, Pennsylvania, talking with Fred Danziger. Fred has a personal collection of over 101 artists, which is on display here for the month of January. Before we start with Fred's gallery talk, I'd like to share a little bit of Fred's background. A Pittsburgh native, Fred received his education at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts. He then embarked on a teaching career spanning over 40 years at the Art Institute of Philadelphia and also at PAFA, where he continues to teach today. Fred has been, over, been in over 20 solo shows as well as over 100 group shows. Gallery representation has included the Sherry French Gallery, the James Gallery, the Roger LaPelle Gallery, the Fan Gallery, and last but not least, Gallery 222. Among his many awards, Fred won an Emmy in 2018 for his illustrative work on the film Before Hollywood. Among his for this show, the works are divided into three rooms. This is the family room. Next door, we have the faculty room. And then the main gallery. We've, deci we've decided to start here in the family room. <clears throat> Can you explain why this is a good place to start? Thanks a lot, Rich. Uh, yeah, I, first of all, I, I really have to thank Andrea Strang for offering this gallery uh, with no strings attached and uh, to show a bunch of things that are already sold. So, uh, you know, it, it's a very unusual thing that Andrea has done and I'm really, thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, I, I've been collecting for quite a while and uh, of course, I, I thought it might be interesting to think, uh, this is a piece of, picture of my father uh, copied from one of my paintings by great friend David Fry. And, uh, you know, we think of uh, family and how we become artists and how we get involved in all this. Uh, certainly my childhood growing up in Pittsburgh, uh, I, di I didn't think I was going to be an artist, although I wanted to be one from, from the, the age of three. And, uh, you know, my mother was very much the, the person who put me on the path to being an artist. and. Uh, had me doing drawings all the time, even as a very little boy, three or four years old. And uh, it's the only thing I've ever wanted to do in life. And uh, so fortunately, with the help of, of that start from my mother and my great high school art teacher, John Drockshow, whose work we will see in the next room, and my wonderful teachers I had at the academy, I've been able to have this life making art. and. Uh, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to purchase works of former students, just artists that I like, and accumulating them, and uh, we that's how we end up having this show. When Rich and I uh, were installing this, what, one of the things we noticed is that a lot of the paintings I have are from married couples or from mothers and daughters. For instance, this is Elizabeth Elf and Sterling Shaw, and uh, they're a married couple. They have a tremendous young, young boy, and uh, they both went to the academy at the same time. And I think it's really interesting to see how couples, there are similarities and certainly differences in their work. I think this, this wall over here, you have uh, a mother and her two daughters, as well as her son-in-law, uh, this is Suzanne LeClaire, Janine LeClaire, and Michelle LeClaire. And uh, Michelle and Donovan Entrican are a married couple. So you have a whole <laughs> family dynamic there. I think it's, it's kind of one of those un unexpected things that happens when you start collecting art. You, uh, you see certain patterns emerge. Uh, this is another mother and daughter. Uh, pairing of Dorothy Wilsey and Allison Wilsey. Uh, very different work. And over here, we have uh, 
Larry Francis and Elizabeth Heller. And I think it's kind of interesting that they're both kind of realists. And if we compare their work to John Sepsik and Lynn Campbell, uh, I think John and Lynn are both kind of very much poetic in their work. And they're both writers as well as, as uh, artists. Uh, another couple that's here is uh, Ryan Bentley and Mary Beth Chu, both very unusual, both uh, kind of a, a kind of an offbeat sense in, in their work, a little bit uh, sort of pop artish as well as a sense of surrealism. And the last uh, couple that I have here is uh, Roger Lapel and Christine McGinnis, and their work is not so obviously. Uh, similar, there are certainly similar palettes and the colors. And I found, you know, Roger always puts a diagonal coming out of one corner and into another, and uh, we see that same thing happening in Christine's work quite often. So even, even when the work is dramatically different in style, sometimes there are similarities with, with color and so on. So, so let's go into the faculty room. Okay, great. Yeah, not everyone in this room is someone, uh, the, the idea was here was people who either taught me or taught with me. Uh, the entire room isn't that way, but, uh, you know, it, for the most part it is. So. Fred, did any of these artists influence you to become a collector? Well, uh, the, the, the artist who, the, the teacher of mine who really shocked me back in 1967, I had my first one-man show, and my great teacher, Jimmy Luders, came, and uh, he bought a painting from this show, you know. And I was floored that Jimmy thought enough first to come to the show and then to buy one of my pieces. And I always thought from that point on, if I can ever be in a position where I can buy the work of my students, boy, I'm going to do it, you know, because I know how, what a great encouragement that was. So Jimmy Luders was very important in that. Uh, this piece is by John Dropshow, who more than anyone else is uh, the reason that I was able to have a life of an artist, and uh, John, just a tremendous encouragement over the years, and, uh, you know, we're still friends, and. Uh, we exchanged paintings a number of years ago, and I uh, was very happy to get this. But I also have work here from, by Dan Miller, who was, nobody does woodcuts better than Dan Miller. I bought this from a gallery called Artist's House uh, a number of years ago, and uh, was thrilled to be able to get one of Dan's pieces. Uh, the, the other academy teacher, Dan taught me at the academy, and I want to make sure I mention Louis Sloan who uh, did this beautiful landscape, plein air landscape in, uh, in the Adirondacks. And Louis, again, was one of those people that you meet along the way and you just are so grateful that you met someone who, who was so generous with his time and his advice and helped, helped guide you along the way as an artist. And how about Charlie Ellis here? You were yeah, saying you something know, about Charlie when you first started at the Academy. Yeah, Charlie, uh, Charlie was, you know, a legendary illustrator, especially in the 50s and early 60s. And my very first day of teaching at the Art Institute, which was my first real teaching job, uh, I taught, I was teaching art history, and after class, Charlie and a guy named Jack Duffy, a tremendous product illustrator, came up to me and said, uh, you want to have lunch with us, you know? So I said, sure. So we went across the street from the school. Uh, we had lunch. And these two guys just, they were like consummate professionals and, and, as commercial artists, you know? And the conversations we had were so, so eye-opening to me as to the differences and similarities between commercial art and fine art. Uh, but I really appreciated the way Charlie and Jack made me feel 
I'm, I'm a 24 year old guy, and I'm, I'm teaching this art history class, and they made me feel really welcome as a faculty member at, at the Art Institute of Philadelphia. So I'm always grateful for Charlie, and he's a wonderful painter. I, I see this almost like a Nicolas Poussin. There's a kind of a solid compositional uh, stillness to this that uh, really just, I, I just love this piece and the way that Charlie expresses pine and grass and so on, but the, the composition is the thing that really floors me with this. Fred, just so you know, Rosalind Bloom is on. She says the family thing is so interesting. Oh, great. Linda Orff is watching. Mike Garrity <laughs> says uh, Fred gave us a tour last Saturday and it was fantastic. Lisa Ford is watching. Andrea, of course, is watching. Great. She you? says hello and blew you kisses. <laughs> We've got Marsha from Williamsport, PA. We have Jean. We have Andrew Fishkin, Bill Volk. Catherine Carney said loved Lewis. Uh, Denise <laughs> Sador is on. She says hi, Fred. Great. And Marble says what a generous thing to do. And Rachel says hi, Fred, which we can show. I believe there's Rachel right over here, is there not? Rachel Altshuler, yes. I love, I love her birds that she paints, and uh, you know, she just, I, I couldn't resist that painting. I, I, this, this is one where I came to a show here, I was not at all intending to buy something, and I just, I, thought, I gotta have this cardinal. <laughs> David Fry says, this is so great, a personal guided tour. Thanks for showing my work first. <laughs> Thank you, David, and I'll be seeing you in class next Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Maureen Pitcher says, hi, Fred, my dear old teacher from the Art Institute. That's right. Hi back, Maureen. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're going to the main gallery. Okay, let's do that. Fred, the big question we've all been waiting to ask is why do you collect art when you've created so many wonderful pieces yourself? Well, that, that is, you know, when we think of the, the whole idea behind this show was really a response to the lockdown that happened in March. Uh, you know, I've, I've had this work for, for a long time, many of it, to, in March, there were so many galleries that shut down and, uh, you know, people lost their shows, museums shut down, uh, art schools themselves shut down, and there was a lot of, almost a kind of a panic in the, in the art world, and, uh, you know, I interacting with people on Facebook and Instagram, and they're saying, oh my God, I lost my show, and you know, what's gonna happen to you? And uh, my response was I decided I was gonna really start to buy a lot of art. So I really bought something almost every week. And of course, it's all piling up in my studio, and I have no room left on the walls, and as pe people often complain, but uh, in, in a conversation with Andrea, she invited me to have this, and I thought, what a great idea that you show a collect, uh, how to collect art. You know, uh, art to me, I, I, I was really in, in, in wondering, how important is art to society? You know, it, it's one of these things where I thought, okay, art was declared non-essential, you know? And to me, it's one of the most essential things in the world. So I, I did thought, was thinking during World War II, uh, in 1942, the British, London was being bombed every May by the German Air Force. And one of the things that the British did, they emptied the museums and they took all that art and they took it to a quarry in Wales. They also sent children north to get them out of harm's way. But that's how important art is to a society. The British saved their art. Those were the treasures. Those were the things that mean so much to their civilization. So if, if anyone doubts the importance of art, 
Just think of that. I mean, that, that, that's a real important thing. So how do we respond when gallery schools and museums are all shut down? How do we respond? And that's where I thought, well, we've got to keep artists. They have bills to pay and so on. For the most part, they couldn't get unemployment and these stimulus checks and stuff like that. Some help, but they didn't have traditional jobs. And many of them were working in restaurants and so on, and the, and the restaurants closed down. So there's a real crisis kind of feeling. And uh, I thought it was important to support the artists. And, and this thing about not having any room, Chris, was <laughs> This is, there are 15 artists here. This, this is a space about five feet, about four, four feet wide. And there are 15 artists that have gotten some encouragement here. And I, I was really delighted uh, the other day to get a, get a message from Colleen Hammond, who did this, that as part of this show, she got in a conversation with Patrice Poor and bought one of Patrice's drawings. So I, lo I love that kind of thing happening. Uh, there are some other artists in the show that have uh, gotten sales already from just the exposure of this. And, you know, I think that's, that's an important thing. So why do we collect art? Because art in general is important. If art itself goes down, what, what am I gonna do? You know, so I've gotta do what I can do to keep it, to keep it going. And one of the things I can do is buy a lot of art. So even on a modest budget, you can you can get moving and start collecting. Now you started collecting back in the in the financial crisis of 2008, right? That is correct. Uh, I, I really started collecting in earnest in uh, 2009, okay. actually after the 2008 crisis. And uh, before we get to that, can yeah. you show us the first piece you bought? Yeah, sure. Now, now, this goes back before that. In 1983, right? That, that is correct. It's a piece by Jack Gerber. This, this is the uh, very first piece that Lil and I purchased, and we got that from Roger LaPel Gallery. Uh, I was very good friends with Jack, uh, kind of lost touch here in the last 10 years or so, but he, he's still working from what I hear. and. Uh, uh, I uh, always loved Jack's work, this kind of universe that he creates of actors and sideshows and, you know, things like that. And he does it all from memory? He does this all from memory, essentially, yeah. And, and he does a lot of gouache work. And this is, this is a gouache, so we kind of uh, thought we, we're going to get one of Jack's pieces. Uh, and uh, this was the very first piece we bought. Now, I, I will say that from 1980, we bought very few pieces up until 97, uh, after the financial crisis. And, uh, you know, that, that's when the real sort of intense collecting period started. So but, even on a modest budget, you were able to get quite a piece. Yeah, I, I mean, this, this one was, was kind of a stretch for us at the time. I remember, <laughs> you know, we, we really do this, you know, and, and you know, you know the amazing thing about art, it, you, you could buy a, a suit of clothes or a car, or, it, you, you know, you buy a car and you spend thousands and thousands of dollars, and, okay, you got to get around, but then, then you, you know, when you're trying to get rid of that car, it's worth a fraction of what, what you paid for, you know, and uh, art is something it does. I, I'm not saying. Uh, well, we want to get to that that question. Well, that's the big question. Yeah. How do you decide what to buy? Yeah. And is it based on style or price, yeah. or is there a unifying principle that you have in the back of your mind? Uh, I, I think as people look around this show, they'll they'll see that. There is no consistency as far as subject matter, style, uh, point of view. The work is uh, straight up realism, abstraction, surrealism, metaphysical art, whimsy, whimsical kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, someone, 
Someone was in the other day, and we were talking about this piece in particular, and, and I, I think uh, this, this is one of the pieces, and I hope you can see it without too much glare, but it's by Susie Shireson, who was a student of mine at the Academy in uh, around the year 2000. And uh, I just recently got this one, and it's called uh, Night Weaver. And to me, this, this is a really great example. It's not a realist piece, even though I'm a realist. I like all kinds of work. So uh, this, this particular piece, she's got this series of little houses with women inside them doing very active things. So you have this uh, almost Van Gogh-like universe swirling around this kind of chaos swirling around this isolated little house and inside this little house is this woman weaving with a rainbow of threads you know and it, it's such a great expression of what's happening in the world today you know the sense of isolation and yet trying to keep art going trying to keep our lives going and on track and clinging to the things that we love to do which you know, in so many cases, is to make art, buy art, see art, have art around us. Very important aspect of life, uh, as it has been for millennia. So, uh, I, 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 what, one other thing about Susie's piece here: the figure is beautifully drawn. You know, as active and chaotic as some of this color and texture is around here, you have this beautifully almost Botticelli-like done figure. And you really sense that hand moving those threads around in there. I think it's a marvelous piece. You know, it's really, really uh, uh, just everything. When, when you say, like, well, why do you collect art? What an image. What, a, what an image to remind us of, of what's happening in the world, you know, of, of how we feel right now. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a record. It's, it's a, a statement about our lives. Just like some time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, why did the cave people draw bison on the walls? You know, we have all these different theories about that. Communicating with the spirits, instructions on how to hunt. Uh, it wasn't really for decoration, that's for sure, because they were in the most inaccessible parts of the caves. So it was about communication with each other, with the spiritual side of art, spiritual side of life, uh, and, and art still does that today. Uh, so, and, and I think Susie's piece is a good example of that. Now, do you ever sell the art that you've collected? Or do you move, try to move it on or uh, share it with people? That, that is, that is a, a question of, that I'm kind of wrestling with right now because you know there are people that want to buy some of these pieces and if they do one of the things that if I do decide to sell it one of the things I'll do is I'll uh, use the proceeds from that to buy another piece from that same artist so that the artist will not be divested from the collection they'll be their, their pieces may be exchanged for, for new pieces and uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm, certainly what I'm hoping is that the, uh, the artists themselves will benefit from this by finding collectors that, that, that want their work, that, that want to, you know, take the work from them and put it in their homes and live with it. And uh, so if, 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 if I can make that connection, out of this show, I, I see no problem in selling some of the works from the show. Uh, We've recently had a piece that was sold in Pittsburgh from a collector, right? Yes. Yeah. And that was at the James Gallery? Yes. James Gallery, a terrific gallery in Pittsburgh. And we're hoping that this is going to be there next. We don't have it 100% confirmed yet, so I'm, I'm giving a qualified answer about James Gallery. Uh, so to me, the, by far the best gallery in Pittsburgh, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that they will be hosting this show uh, in the next couple of months, actually. So, 
but we, we still have to work that, that out finally. Okay. So. Uh, well, I asked you about the first piece you bought. What's yeah. the last piece you bought? Uh, well, the last piece is in the family room there, and you were here when when John Sevcik brought it in. That, that, the uh, one of the people watching the comment. I was. So, you, you know, and I just uh, got another one in the mail the other day. We're not stopping. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to keep uh, keep getting new, a bunch of new piece from Benjamin Long, who's down there on the quirky kind of wall, and uh, a terrific piece. And uh, they'll, when the show goes to Pittsburgh, which I hope will happen, that piece will be in that show. Now, Fred, you said there's 117 artists here right now. Do yeah. you only buy from a new artist? And by new, I mean someone you haven't bought from before? Or are there artists that you've bought several pieces from? Almost all these artists, I have more than one piece. Uh, you know, uh, I, I like to have multiple pieces from the artists. Uh, you know, you, to see kind of a range of what they do, their progression. Progression, yeah, like the one I just bought of Benjamin Long's, the first one I bought from him probably 20 years ago, that was one of the early ones that, that, that I purchased, and now I just got a new one from him. But uh, Now, Fred, we should tell people that you will be at Gallery 222 until January, January 30th. 30th yeah. And yeah. you are actually here every day from Wednesday to Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5. Yes. Now, You're here painting. Yes. Now, 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 I am going to have to miss Thursdays, uh, the next two Thursdays, because I am teaching. I'm hoping to get somebody to sit, sit in here and keep the gallery open, but I'm not, I haven't nailed that down yet. So, uh, but yeah, I have my stuff set up here, and I'm actually working on a little <laughs> painting on a matchbook. I, I got the... I mean, I'd rather focus on the other paintings here, but, uh, you know, I got this idea to do a painting on a matchbook cover, uh, so I just said the matchbook, and I'm, I'm, I'm painting this, uh, this thing from the 1950s onto an actual book of matches, and uh, so I'm, I'm, working, I'm working on things while I'm here when there's nobody in the gallery, but when people come in, I, you know, I'll show them around and, and so on. Ask me about that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, you're you're explaining to me that it's quite a message on the back. Yeah. And that's an artist who went to Israel during the Six Day War. Yes. Yeah. Can uh, you show uh, us the back of it? Yes, I will. And, and you know, this this morning on on Facebook. Uh, one of the questions that, you know, I solicited questions, what, what would you like me to answer? And someone said, can you talk to us about the meaning of art? And I, I, I think this painting by Adam Merrill is, is one of the best ones for me to talk about that topic. What, you know, what is it about art that makes it important? You know, what, what's that thing? We're talking about the unifying, uh, so to me, even though the subject and the look and the size and the medium are all different in these pieces. There's one very consistent thing, and that they are all fine art. Now, what I mean by that is that the artist had something inside them, something important that they wanted to say, they wanted to express. They're not manufacturing something, they're, they're creating a message, a voice that talks. The great thing about art, it talks to future generations. You know, we, we have these conversations and, you know, they're gone. This painting is going to, it's talking to me now, but it'll talk a hundred years from now, hopefully. It'll, it, it, can, it can remain talking. Uh, Adams, th this, this painting, when I first saw it, I was just totally uh, entranced by the image of a, a man on a horse racing a bus under the moon in a desert. That's all I knew about it. I just loved that image. And, and in the midst of the pandemic and all that, I have uh, 
you know, this thought, we're, we're chasing after something, you know, the idea, of, and, and in a way, all my life, I've been chasing after the perfect painting. You know, I, I always think, how do I do a better painting, the best painting possible? And, yeah, you, know, you know, you put, <laughs> get an idea of the scale of that. And uh, th there's something about that pursuit of tr the truth, the, tr the pursuit of beauty, the truth of this kind of ephemeral thing that we think of as art, uh, that is so difficult to explain if we try to define it. You know, we almost find different, every person has their own subjective definition of what art is. But to me, it, it has to move me, touch me, uh, make, make me think, make me feel, you know, just like a good book, a great song, a great painting. Now this one, as you said, Adam, you know, what, one of the things about collecting art, you know, you, you get these, now he, he wrote on here, the title was Raising the Moon, and then he changed it, maybe it's Grazing the Moon, self-portrait, uh, and it's the Negev Desert in Israel. And he wrote me a very nice note here. Thanks for adopting one of my children, pal, uh, Adam Aroff. And, you know, he's got a nice signature there. And, you know, when you buy real art, when you, when you, you, you become a part of the history of this thing. You become a part of the history of the artist's work. And that artist's work is part of the history of our times. And all the things that have happened, all the, uh, the warfare and so on that, that is going on in here, and this, this I, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what Adam means by this painting, you know. But it, the, just the, the thought of the horse, the bus, the moon in a desert just strikes me as such a, 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 a relevant statement to everything that goes on in life, you know. So that's a... And that was during the Sixth Day War. Well, yes, during that time, yes. Yeah, I'm not sure the exact time and so on. And, but. Uh, you know, Adam is a tremendous artist, and I, I, I hope to get more of his work in the future. I think, that he, you know, Rich, as we were putting the show together, it, it became interesting to me, and I never realized how many paintings of, with moon in them. I had a lot of nocturnes. Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, I, I think even if we, if we look at, uh, you know, Eliza Auth, Elise Phillips, Jim Simmons, three paintings of the moon, very similarly composed, very interesting where, where the moon is placed in the rectangle. Uh, and, and that's you know, part of the value of buying more than one piece of work, of collecting art. You know, you know the art collection itself it almost becomes a work of art, you know, where, where you, you're, you're uh, you're painting your environment essentially with with the work of other artists, you know, which which is fascinating to me. So, uh, you know, the, the different color palettes and so on, and then Jim in this he puts Jupiter up in there. What a beautiful composition. Jim was a uh, classmate of mine at the academy, and he donated this painting and the Louis Sloan painting in the other room to this collection. Hmm. Uh, to, to go around the country uh, to the various venues that we are planning. So I was thrilled to get not only Jim's work, but Louis Sloan's and this Paul Kane over here, this great Paul Kane. Let's look at that Paul Kane. Paul Kane. Okay. okay. I love it. <laughs> what a great show. I love, I love your work and I love your collection. Thank you. Thank you. Where are we going, Fred? Yeah, I, I, I did want to talk about this Paul Kane. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a great example of uh, photorealist kind of style of uh, using, uh, you know, creating something that it, it looks so three-dimensional when you look at it, and you almost can't realize that it's a, it's a flat painting. Uh, 
you know, unless you go around on the side. And uh, But uh, Paul was another classmate of mine at the Academy, and he had, had his ups and downs in, uh, in, in his career, uh, showed with Mizell in, in New York City for quite a while when, when Mizell was inventing the term photorealism. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just thrilled that I have an example of Paul Keynes. And this, this is the one that Jim Simmons sent. I, I do have three of my own of Paul's works that I bought. But uh, Jim's is, is bigger and very finely done. So I, I, I was thrilled to get that. Andrea calls it a wow piece. Yes, it, it, it's, it's, a real, it's a real stunning piece. <laughs> Do you have more questions as we wrap things up? Uh, we have more comments. Beth says, I love the handwritten notes from the artist on the back of their painting. It means so much more to you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, almost everything that I bought during the pandemic, I've gotten a, a, a really nice note. Let, 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 let me just show you this. Uh, for instance, I don't know if Carol Rankin, I don't, I don't know if there's anything on the back of this. Let's see. Now, I, I framed this one. <laughs> but she, uh, she sent me uh, a, a really beautiful note. And the, the work that I purchased, she sent me another one as a gift. Uh, you know, which, which was just a, a really beautiful gesture, I thought. Uh, Steve High, Rich, you were, you were asking, do I ever sell work? I had an event happen uh, in January or so of, this, of 2020, and uh, some people had bought one of my, two of my pieces at auction, and they contacted me to know if I would be interested in buying them back, and I was. And uh, they came to my studio with these two pieces, and I really wanted these two pieces. <laughs> and Newark, New York, uh, what, what's their, uh, I can't think of their Instagram handle right now, but uh, they, 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 we, they wanted too much cash for them, but they, they looked at my collection and said, how about that, how about that? And I had a robot painting by Stephen High, and they really wanted that robot painting. So that became part of the transaction where I got one or two paintings back, I, paid them some cash, but I also gave them some, some artwork from my collection. And I really didn't want to part with the Stephen High. But I also really wanted those two paintings back, right? So, so we did that, and I thought, I'm going to try to get another Steve High robot. So I went out in the market, and I located this. And, uh, you know, I, I, I love Steve. Steve is a, an incredible artist. He can work in any style. He's written beautiful children's books. Uh, he's, you know, published author. Really taught it more for many years. And you know, this this painting of uh, Robbie the robot from uh, Forbidden for for, for Planet. Planet, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, just beautifully rendered. And uh, you know, Fred Carroll would like to know where do you hang this art at home, throughout the house? Question I mark. It almost all in my studio. Uh, and, and you know, that, that's where you get into this thing where you say, well... Not enough room. Not enough <laughs> room, yeah. And, and this is why when people tell me they don't have enough room to buy another piece of art, there's always room for more art, you know. You, you can rotate your collection. You can, you can put it in a, in a closet for a while and, and bring, put some new pieces out and then you change it and it's like, wow, I've got a whole new thing around me, right? But the other thing is, this this room you could take another 20 pieces i could put another 20 or 30 pieces in this room and it would not it would still look great i think it looks fantastic i must say you really. have a lot of people on here who are saying the same thing fred so oh. a lot of people agree with you <laughs> <laughs> well I, I i'm glad to hear that and uh so there's a story on this one other painting uh, okay before we're done this is the carpo uh, Helena Carpo, now th this is one of those internet stories that I think, you know, this is, this is our Russian uh, contingent to this collection. This, and, and you notice there's an actual necklace here. So it's an international show. It certainly is. 
<laughs> she makes it international. Uh, this is called The Bird Within Us All. And, she, you know, she's... I met her on Instagram just... You know, she, she posts art, and uh, somehow I, I found Helena's work and looking at it, and she had also put some photographs of her cat, a really beautiful cat that she has. And I made a comment, your cat would make a beautiful painting, and she came back and said, you know, oh, if you would paint it, that, that, that would be so fantastic, and I would send you one of my art in exchange if you wanted, if you wanted to try doing that. So sure enough, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to try it, you know. You know this, this was actually a couple years ago, before all the stuff, you know. So I, I did a painting of her cat. She sent me an address, and I packed it up. I sent it to her, and the next thing you know, there she is in Russia, and she's holding up my painting of a cat. And she uh, sent me, I, now this is a very strange story. She sent me her artwork. And the box arrived and it was empty. <laughs> and there, there was, someone had slit the box and taken the artwork out mm. before it got to me. So I get this empty box and I said, well, I get the box and it arrived safely, but there's nothing in it, you know, and it's just empty packing. And she's like, oh my God, somebody, somebody stole it, I'm sure somebody stole it. And she went to all the trouble to do another piece and she sent me this and she also sent me one of those Russian dolls where you open it up and there's another one mm -hmm. inside and another one inside. She sent me one of those that she had done some painting on. So, Fred, Catherine Carney is wondering what do you think the future for art is? That is a really great and big unanswerable almost. I mean, who would have thought that the present of art would be the way that it is? Now, I'm standing here with a mask on because we're afraid of each other uh, w without a mask on, you know. So, I, I, I can say this though, I am sure that art is going to survive this, that it, it is such an essential part of our humanity that we're not going to let it go. Artists are still going to work no matter what. You know, if, if you're a real artist, you're going to keep working. You may take time off, you may take years off, but eventually, you're going to return to that thing inside you that motivates you and says, I've got to say something about this, and I'm going to say it in art. Just like the graffiti artists in ancient Egypt, what, whatever. You know, we want to make our mark, we want to say something, and, and we can speak to those future generations with what we do today. So art's going to keep going. I'm not sure whether it's going to be more online or whether will ever have crowded openings again with tables of food? I don't know. We hope so. And, uh, you know, if the vaccines work and eventually the... I mean, the flu eventually went away, right, in the 20s. And they let the good times roll. Maybe something like that will happen again. Certainly hope so. Because I love the openings. I love going to figure drawing classes with everyone and you know, just having a lot of fun. Okay, well that was a great ending question. What are your hours again? Well, from 11 to 5. Uh, and again, I, I will be here Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, someone, I hope, will be here Thursday, but Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, definitely I will be here. So we're pleased to see this. This is a great exhibition. It, it's un unlike any show I've ever seen. So many artists, so many styles. You know, it, it, it's pretty incredible, I think. Yeah. Well, that about does it. And thank you very much for your gallery talk. Thank you all for tuning in. I, I really appreciate it.